I don't want no oil A spoil in my shoreline I like fish much better than crud I like birds and things A creeping and crawling Won't trade no more oil for blood The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run but that black demon oil's got us fussing and fighting, and I do believe it's time we was done. I don't want them nukes run by them kooks who think radioactivity is fun. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog The sun don't give us all we need To make this country run But that nuclear power's got us Fussing and fighting And I do believe it's time we was done No news! Toledo and good afternoon Columbus and good morning Bowling Green and hello to everyone on the internet wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe DeMar and I am here with my fantastic co-host Rebecca Wood. Yes and together Rebecca and I are going to craft yet another incredible hour of radio called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a show where we talk about ecology and the environment and we talk about them in the ways that they affect you, your wealth, your health, your happiness, the wealth and health and happiness of the, the birds and the frogs and the salamanders and basically everybody and everything, because like it or not, we are all here on this wonderful planet together called Earth. And we've got a really nice show for you today. We're just gonna chat for a bit for the next, oh, 10 minutes or so. And you're welcome to call in at 877-909-1007. That's 877-909-1007. With any kind of eco observations or questions you might have, then uh, we're gonna have kind of an interesting take. Usually we have a, an individual guest that we do an interview. And instead today I did a, a, a press conference that was done by a bunch of uh, indigenous people in Toronto this past week. Uh, it's pretty revealing. They went and they were at the uh, Royal Bank of Canada's annual general meeting and afterwards they had a press conference and I, I, I took a big chunk of that press conference and just put it right into kind of an interview sort of format because normally organizations have these press conferences and people don't actually get to hear what they say. They, so. I thought this would be a, an informative thing. Uh, then we'll hear from our advertisers and patrons to whom we are eternally grateful. And uh, then Rebecca, what will you be discussing today? I am going to talk about garlic mustard. Okay, garlic. Not the not mustard with garlic in it that you buy at the store. <laughs> okay. Completely different. So not garlic and mustard. No, no. Garlic no. mustard. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, then it's ecological news, and we have our, our usual mix of good and bad news, uh, but always interesting news. And as I say, at some point, let's hope to hear from you at 877-909-1007. So, of course, the big news in the natural world this past week was the eclipse. <laughs> and it's it's kind of funny, isn't it? It seems like, it already seems like that was a hundred years ago to me. It you does. Know, it was, a lot has happened this week. Yeah, a lot's happened, and it was such an otherworldly experience. It doesn't, like, kind of fit into the week, <laughs> right. if you know what I mean. It's kind of like one of those memories that is now, like, there permanently. So uh, we had a wonderful view. Uh, my son and I drove down to North Baltimore because uh, by driving south those uh, 15 miles or so, we got another 30 seconds of totality. And uh, we were there uh, on a trail, so we were outside the city and there were no artificial lights to, to dim anything. And we had just had an amazing view. It was an incredible experience. And if you want to share yours, by all means, call in 877-909-1007. 
And of course, uh, spring is finally here, apparently. Uh, we have, uh, this is our second day in a row with just nice sunny weather. <laughs> kind of hard to believe. And uh, all the trees and the are flowering and uh, I was kind of realizing I have these two trees outside my on outside my house they're service berry trees and uh, they're, they're in full flower but I have not yet seen a bee this year oh we have a call sure great hello caller go ahead hi you're on hello, the, hello you're on the air yes hi I am um... It's not about the eclipse, but I was wondering if you had a um, chance to look at the new uh, EPA limits for PFAS and if they're sufficient. Sorry, it's my dog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we actually reported on those. We never have trouble with dogs here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're very, this is very, probably the most dog friendly show on the radio apart from dog actual dog shows but right. uh yeah we reported on that uh, a few months ago that they're they're putting limits down in the parts per trillion and parts parts per quadrillion which is just uh incredible um and so yeah it's it's a good thing and it, it does seem to be that this epa is definitely picking up on in terms of enforcement and uh and rule setting it's it's uh it's good to see in fact we have a story a related story on a couple other pollutants uh during our ecological news segment but uh yeah but what do you think about what they're doing with pfas well you know certain limits is one thing but from my experience in working with a couple of different organizations monitoring water now, I don't have any way to test for that. It's sort of beyond my capabilities, but um, I don't know how if the Ohio EPA is going to step up because I believe Lake Erie is very high. It's going to be over the limit in a lot of instances, and they don't want to lose the tourist dollars and fishing and everything. Mm. So I'm worried about that um, because I've been chasing that for a while trying to get scientists to talk about it and all, you know, they're like, well, even locally, a university of school scientist who does water testing and monitors, you know, according, you know, just the algae bloom thing was like kind of soft stepping around the issue. So I'm like, so I think it's going to be a very, I think it's going to be a big issue here. And so, you know, I hope that Marcy Catherine and other people can lean on that. I called there and asked, you know, for them to kind of look over the shoulder of the IEPA, get them to do their do their job. And regardless of where things go, they got the chips got to fall where they are. Yeah, it 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 can kind of set up a bit of a crisis here, can it? Because the the limits are so low. I mean, they're literally beyond detection limits for most uh, laboratories and and. And so if you have a, a federal standard that is like in, like parts per quadrillion is just an incredibly low uh, bar. And, but so what's going to happen? Will it be enforceable? And so I, I think what they're taking, that the direction they're taking is that it's going to be enforced to the lowest possible limit that, that you can detect. So in other words, if your lab or your Ohio EPA or whoever's doing the testing can only catch parts per hundred million uh, or parts per billion or parts per 10 billion, then, you know, if you get positive on anything you can detect, then you have to start taking action, which, uh, which will be very interesting to see what they do or how they can do it. Yeah, I'm just worried about, I know a lot of people who consume a lot, you're talking weekly fish out of that out of that lake and you know this uh, PFAS is called a forever chemical for a reason and so the cumulative effect in their bodies you know that's so I, I get it it's just sticky but um, mainly we just have to I, first of all obviously is to stop contributing stop putting and I think that yeah here here 
you know, you got to just stop putting it in there. And it's so, but all right, we'll have a good thing. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the call. Thanks very much. And of course, we welcome any call at 877-909-1007. Okay, so we've got the flowering, and um, but we don't have the bees, or at least I have not yet seen a bee this year. I, I think I saw one in a tree with some kind of blossoms yesterday, a couple days ago. So you saw like one. Or, or some kind of a, I don't know, it might have been a pollen, it was a fly or a, a bee fly, I don't know, but it... There are flies that pollinate, yeah. there's there's beetles and that something, pollinate. Something was buzzing around those those uh, those blossoms. Yeah, magnolia trees, I guess, uh, get pollinated by beetles. Um, oh, I think it was a magnolia tree, I can't remember, but I think it was. Ah, so you might have seen yeah. one of the, a, a beetle as opposed to a bee, yeah. but... Um, but yeah, it, it just, I'm a little worried. And they're, they're predicting this is going to be the year with trillions of cicadas. But uh, I don't know. It's, it seems like it's a hard year for all insects. And I don't, I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know if, if they're really going to come out in the numbers they're, they're predicting. But I guess we'll see. Um, so anyway. <laughs> birds got to eat something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it. No, yeah. no insects means no birds. Windfall for the uh, for yeah. the birdies when the cicadas come. Actually, everything eats those cicadas. Yeah, uh, <laughs> snakes eat them. Raccoons eat them. Uh, I've seen birds, you know, like pluck them off the sidewalk and, and you know, fly them back to their nests. I used to walk a dog who ate them out from under the out from under plants where there was beer dirt. Like yeah, she she'd take a mouthful of something and you'd see something wriggling, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're very nutritious, yeah. and humans eat them too. I, I've never eaten them personally, but I guess there's a lot of recipes on the internet. The like the settlers used to just fry them up and eat them all the time. So. Uh, maybe they're eating the crops, so they kind of had to. <laughs> maybe all, well, all they eat is uh, they. They live on the roots of trees, oh, so so they don't feed on crops. They don't feed on. So this was something else: the grasshopper epidemic in uh, in the little house on the prairie books, I guess. Yeah, those are locusts. Okay. Yeah, th those eat your crops. But, Interesting. But no, uh, uh, cicadas they plant their eggs in the the small branches of trees that then die and fall off into the ground, and then the the larvae burrow down into the ground and they live off roots and and uh, organic matter in the soil for you know, however many years, one year, 11 years, seven years, depending on which brood they're in. So so they're, they're cool, really cool insect. Let's hope we do see trillions of them, but I don't know, I'm a little worried. <laughs> My dad really hates them. Did I tell you why? I think I already told you why. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah, when he was in uh, Skopje in a big earthquake in the 60s in Yugoslavia, he had to do triage for, uh, for the, the amputation tent. Mm. And it was all these mothers uh -huh. uh, good many of them were Islamic or or because it was you know it's a kind of a mixed area so uh, unfortunately the people who he he picked to go in the tent mostly survived and the people that he left out under the tree mostly did not okay. which meant every time that he picked a new group to go in the uh, tent the rest of them would set up with a sort of a keening ululation mm. sound and it reminds him of uh, oh cicadas of cicadas sounds. somehow oh. I guess yeah huh. interesting <laughs> yeah yeah, you know what? I think you did tell that story before. Yeah, I but, think I did. Yeah, yeah but maybe. I, yeah. I can't remember. All right. <laughs> well, all right. So uh, back to the show here. And um, so one of the things that's going to happen, I'm afraid, in my yard is that this, these serviceberry bushes that I have, uh, they just came out and some guy with spray paint uh, spray painted the line for the gas line. I think they're going to tear up my serviceberry bushes to put in a gas line. Do it. And it just reminded me of just how, you know, as long as we're hooked on this on natural gas, uh, we've got these small impacts in people's yards. But of course, then there's also bigger impacts from pipelines. You might remember the Nexus pipeline went all the way through Ohio just a few years ago, and they clear cut 100,000 acres or something like that of like trees and, and, br and brush and natural areas to put this pipeline right through the middle of it. And so that kind of brought me to uh, our interview for to our quote unquote interview for the day, because uh, these indigenous people went to the annual general meeting of the Royal Bank of Canada. And one of the things that they were protesting was the Trans Mountain Pipeline, the one that um, the Wet'suwet'en tribe, we've been covering this 
uh, controversy for years now that have tried to block, you know, physically tried. Well, they fought it in courts for a decade and then the courts ruled against them. And so then they tried to fight it with protests. And uh, now they're trying to do shareholder advocacy. In other words, they went to the, they bought shares in this horrible, horrible bank so they could speak at the annual shareholders meeting. And well, then you'll hear what happened in the interview. So, uh, Jared, let's go ahead and play that interview. Danny's eight years, Sakai's eight years, this guy's the as stated, I am keeping them off. I also caretake the name of Chief Reese, which is a high-ranking war chief. Our nation and what we've been put through, and oh, you've got to remember all of this is financed by RBC. You know, this Royal Bank of Canada, they fund the Royal Canadian Mountain Police. I don't know what is so royal about what they do, but trust. I went to England and I addressed the king and I asked that very question because I always have hope. Believe it or not, I'm an optimist. I always want something better. I know if we work hard, we'll get better. But when you come to the Royal Bank of Canada's AGM and again get treated in this manner, it's hard to keep focused on who you are, what you want, and knowing you're doing the right thing when they don't have the humanity to address you properly to let you speak, to listen to you. When they can say you've got one minute, 60 seconds to express what they do, that's not a problem. And I want to remind people, it is your money that is upholding them to push these laws. It is your money that enables them to be the number one financer of oil and gas production, pipeline, all these destructive industries in this country. They're number one. They're top five in the world. I think that the people really have to realize if you deal with different institutions, we may get a better result. I am tired of going there and having Dave Mackay look at us and try to tell us that they're doing the best thing for everybody when 2050 is so far away, when 2030 is so far away, when what they've already done to this planet is happening now. So when we come here as Indigenous leaders, as humans, to address them, and you get 60 seconds, to address what they do with their billions and trillions of dollars. That is not the way that any bank should operate. They bought HSBC because HSBC was going to have a greener plan for their bank. They bought it so they don't have to meet those standards. And yet they stand there and tell us about how great they're doing, how advanced they are. They're going to look towards green economies. But why 2050? When they're doing the damage. When our people get arrested, removed from the land, we're simply protecting clean water, who we are. And knowing that they are assisting in taking away the power of the people, taking away the hearts, their voices, and their, with their money. And knowing that the very democracy of this country is being threatened by the money that they put into oil and gas, mine, force. The insults that were done, we should be getting used to it. Two years ago, we came here to Toronto, the hereditary chiefs. When we landed, we needed a virtual meeting. Last year, we went to Saskatoon. We looked up after the AGM, their snipers on the roof. This year, they gave us 60 seconds to talk about that, to talk about the money that they are controlling. doesn't have a conscience. The human does. So they're removing, removing the human capacity. That is there to make the call on what happens to that money. We call upon all people all businesses, withdraw your money from that bank. Find a better use for it, because obviously they are not listening to what you want done with the country. When they can only talk of, about the bottom of the line and remove the humanity that everybody needs to survive, then you gotta remove yourself from that type of bank. But all they wanna talk about is the very fact that if they can make a profit, they won't tell you what the cost is to you, to the human to what we want, clean water, clean air, the freedoms that we need. We know as what's open, we are the template of what will happen to this country. By RBC being there, funding this, they are also funding RCMP. They create an arm of the Royal Canadian Mountain Police. It's called CURB. They rebranded themselves as CRU, Critical Response Center. That didn't exist before 2017. But why doesn't RBC be honest and say that what they're doing in Canada is affecting the world. 
Why can't they take responsibility that their money is killing this planet? And why would they ever say that they are doing an AGM where they want to listen to shareholders? We were there as proxy holders. We weren't listening to, not in 60 seconds. We often ask banks to just listen, be human, take the future into consideration, not the bottom line. What is most important to us is our children and grandchildren, your children and your grandchildren. And when you get a bank such as RBC, totally ignoring what they are doing to the world, then you need to speak up. My name is Sidney Simbi, and I am a student at the University of Waterloo. And an organizer of Change Force. I am here today because I'm inspired by all those fighting extraction on the front lines across so-called Canada because I feel deeply connected and in solidarity with African organizers back home on the front lines fighting similar projects funded by major financial giants like RBC, far removed from the cultural and environmental impacts. Today I am in particularly thinking of those fighting the East African crude oil pipeline going through my ancestral homelands a project that RBC supported through $1.45 billion in total energies between 2016 and 2020. I'm also here representing a national movement of students across so-called Canada and a, student as, and as a student at the University of Waterloo, a key feeder for RBC, a campus that RBC recently made a $2 million donation to for a Bachelor of Sustainability and Financial Management program. While RBC continues to fund projects that put the lives of those here at risk every day and students' futures in jeopardy, they fund sustainable finance initiatives to greenwash their actions and impress young people, but students across all campuses see through it. And all across so-called Canada, students are taking action to kick RBC off of our campuses. 11 student unions at major universities representing 450,000 students have already called on major banks like RBC to immediately stop funding these detrimental practices. RBC's branches on two campuses have already been closed down due to student action. Business students now learn about RBC's hypocrisy in core curricular courses and we are just getting started. They try to censor us in the AGM and try to censor us on our campuses. Students across many university campuses have faced police and escalating responses from on-campus branches. RBC wants to shut down student dissent and they are using fear of police and arrest to scare students. We won't be dissuaded from returning to campuses. RBC uses police and the state to shut down resistance. We are not going to stop organizing on our campuses and in every space RBC attempts to greenwash until they meet our demands to defund the coastal gasoline pipeline and GMX, respect free, prior and informed consent of indigenous nations, and to divest from fossil fuels. I would also like to add um, regarding today's events, they won't listen or engage with us in the AG AGM rooms, so we will have to take it to the streets, as we did today with the outside mobilization, and on our campuses, and we will make you hear us. Your time is up, and the people will govern. The age of fossil fuels has gone. It is time to invest in sustainable, justice-centered energy projects and solutions. Frontline communities have the solutions. Indigenous-led governance is the solution. Your archaic practices, repression and silencing tactics do not work. The power of the people is stronger than those in power. Stronger than your executives, stronger than RBC, stronger than you, Dave McKay and the rest of the executives getting rich off of our deaths and our community's destructions. And we call on you, people of conscious, to join us. Thank you. I'm here today because I'm trying to save the lives of the people in my community. I'm a director and founder of a faith-based organization called Rise St. James. This organization came to God. God touched my heart and asked me to fight for most of plastics. I came here today to talk to RBC, but when I spoke, I didn't know what section I was supposed to, spoke, to speak in. Then um, I asked the question, but I, didn't, but I didn't get an answer. I feel like I was wasting my time 
because I came all the way from St. James, Louisiana, to talk to these shareholders who are poisoning us. My community is dying because of people like RBC. They are out to make money. They don't care if they pollute us. They don't care if we don't drink clean water. They don't care if we breathe uh, clean air. Now from, we have 12 industries within a 10 mile radius. People are dying. Our work has benzene in it. Our air is polluted. Our soil is polluted. We cannot make a garden anymore. I have a friend of mine who's diagnosed with colon cancer. And my classmate diagnosed with liver cancer. I have two brothers with prostate cancer. And the list goes on and on. Our politicians are in the pockets of these industries. Our politicians, some of them don't understand the effects of the pollution. Some of them don't understand how people are dying, even though their family members are dying. They don't understand. They think that industry can just come in and they're, they're supposed to open the red carpet for them. They don't realize we are the people, we are speaking, and we as a people will make a difference because we went to the, um, to the EPA hearing on Tuesday and uh, they announced the harms rules. The harms rules, the standards are set so low. The industry, they're going to think twice before they come into St. James Parish and throughout Texas and Mississippi and so on. So I have hope because of this harm's rule. Some of it is good and some of it is not to where we want it to be yet. But that's a start. With chloroprene, the levels are so low until they will not be able to function at that low level. So that's one way we're going to beat them. And we're going to beat any other industry that tries to come into my community. We are not going to take any more. We will not be silent. And this will be the beginning of the end for all of this fossil fuel. Just like I said, 2024 will be a change, and this is the change. These people are not listening to us, so we are the people. We have to take our country back, our state back. We work together, and we can do it. But we got to stand together. We can't let these people dictate to us our lives and how we're going to be poisoned because they are poisoning us. All this fossil fuel, if it's killing us, get rid of it. Find another solution. We don't have to take this. We are the people. We stand together, we want to fight together, and we will not be silent. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Miku, my name is Crystal Cavalier, citizen of the Open Nation Band of the Supporting Nation from Mebane, North Carolina, United States. I'm a mother of five water protector and co-founder of Seven Directions of Service with my husband. I don't know whether to be sad, mad, angry, I have all these emotions pent up inside me. Um, my message to the people of the world is I don't feel as an indigenous person I was respected when I came here to the RBC. Um, I am a community leader of my Monica and Okaniche and Sakoni relatives. And honestly, they need to have frontline people on their board. Um, I felt that the words the RBC said are performative and will tokenize anyone for their optics. After I was interrupted while asking my question, I wasn't even given the respect to have an entire minute before being interrupted. Like, the woman was like, what's your question? You will be quiet. You were heard my question. I was there to, to talk about their risk, um, their client, the Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Southgate Extension. We've been fighting this mainline pipeline for 10 years in the Southgate portion for seven. And now other pipelines are starting to come together and merge with this Mountain Valley pipeline. My question was dismissed, but they didn't give any thought to my question. It kind of reminded me of a scene from this Disney movie, uh, Mary Poppins, where all these bank executives were sitting around the table and not listening, and somebody kept saying, give me, me, give me my money. That's what I wanted to say, give me my money back. Um, you know, we've always seen nature as a living entity with its own rights rather than a resource to be exploited and controlled. The RBC is funding poisons and toxins being blown into our environment and killing our fish, animals, and even our, our relatives. Our 
original instructions have been forgotten. You know, again, I travel across this border. They're investing in a company that does not use free prior informed consent. And it has been known to violate many human rights. Um, I'm inviting all the RBC board and executives to come to North Carolina and see this pristine mountaintop that are being blown off and being financed by your company. And our sacred rivers are being born, born under. We wrote to the United Nations Special Rapporteurs and we did hear back from one from the Human Rights Commission Office of the Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. They have confirmed receipt of our submission and they're going to start listening to us. Like Celine and Sharon said, we're going to have to take this to the streets. I'm asking everyone to join our movement and we will not be defeated. We're going to stand up and fight this. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Richard Brooks. I'm the Climate Finance Director with Stanford. I think what we saw today is um, very different than last year. Last year, we faced segregation. Um, my brothers and sisters with um, my indigenous brothers and sisters and my black brothers and sisters and other frontline community members faced segregation last year. And this year, we faced censorship. Um, we've heard stories already of that um, censorship. And I'm really disappointed with Canada's largest bank for disrespecting everybody who showed up and traveled so far today to hear their voices heard, to speak to management, to get their, their questions answered. Many of them, if they even got their questions out, do not even get an answer to those questions. And it's, it's disrespect that you should not be hearing from Canada's largest bank. But it's not out of the ordinary. It's very similar to the approach that they take to how they finance their fossil fuel projects, how they go about their business. It's not one of listening and taking action and responding to the stories that people have but it's rather steamrolling them and deflecting and ignoring. Last week, uh, the CEO of RBC stated to the Canadian press, and I quote, RBC can't get ahead of its own country. We can't move faster. He was referring to the energy transition and its pace in Canada. He has said repeatedly over the last several months that he wants RBC to be a leader and must provide the leadership that Canada deserves. I wanted to ask today if there was an opportunity to ask a question during the general Q&A. Um, how do you square these seemingly opposing statements? We need Canada's biggest bank, its largest corporation, to drive the energy transition, to be in the driver's seat and not to be in the trunk. That's literally where they are sitting in terms of the energy transition. They're in the trunk and they are somehow sticking their foot on the brake at the same time. And what this means is phasing down fossil fuel financing and going even further than what RBC announced last month when it said it was going to put um, a triple their amount of financing into renewables. We know from the data that is available, the publicly available data that Schubert New Energy Finance has compiled, that, en that the energy financing ratio of RBC is amongst the worst of all global banks. For every dollar that they put into dirty energy, to dirty fossil fuels, only 37 cents is going into low carbon energy and renewables. When the ratio needs to be four to one, four dollars going into renewables and climate solutions for every dollar going into fossil fuels. Simply addressing one side of the equation is not enough. And even what RBC announced last month, a big number, 35 billion dollars into renewables, sounds like a lot. That will only get them to a one to one ratio by 2030. Best. RBC is very uh, proud of the fact that it's now going to be disclosing this data of how much it's putting into dirty fossil fuels versus renewables, but data is meaningless if you're not going to use that data to take action. We need RBC to be a leader, we need them to address this ratio and fix it and set a pace for the rest of the country. Okay, so I wanted to play that for you in that format because I wanted you folks to get a sense of what happens at these things. This press conference went on for an hour, and as you could hear, those people were very articulate, they made wonderful points. Uh, the longest one only spoke for five minutes, most of them only spoke for three. But to be cut off after one minute at a, at a shareholders meeting is essentially it's censorship, because you, can't, you can hardly say anything in one minute. And there were a lot of press at that press conference, but the articles that came out after, all the wonderful, articulate, you know, passionate speech in each of the articles that came out after, you'd be lucky if you got one sentence from one of the speakers. Um, and so I was glad to be able to this format to bring you 
give you a little bit of feeling of what it was like to actually be in that room that usually only reporters get that experience. So happy to share that with you. And the only reason we're able to share that with you is because we are sponsored by a wonderful uh, advertisers and patrons. And so let's hear from our advertiser now. For a Green Future is also brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They also restore wildlife habitats and lead people on outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every day of the year. There are several ways to get a hold of them and find out what's happening. One is to call them at 419-353-1897. Another is to visit their website, www.wcparks.org. The website, again, is at www.wcparks.org. They are also available on all social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and many others. Just search for WC Parks. That's the Wood County Park District, and we're very grateful for their support. And, of course, we're also grateful for the support of our patrons. And these are wonderful people who've gone to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And there they searched for For a Green Future, up popped our Patreon page, and they signed up for monthly contributions that match their own budget. Uh, you get to decide yourself how much you would like to give. There's suggested levels of giving, but... Um, we're very grateful for every dollar and every cent that people give us because it, we really need it. <laughs> so, thanks. And one thing that we do with our time, of course, is we give a little bit of time every week to Rebecca. And Rebecca, what's our topic for this week? All right. Well, this is inspired by me suddenly seeing a, a flower that looked familiar in my neighborhood. It's on a lot of people's lawns, and it looks quite a bit like something uh, called garlic mustard, which I saw a few years ago on South Bass Island at the Nature Center on the grounds. And they told me, oh yeah, we have uh, parties to come and uh, rip that stuff out every year. Uh, but it's, they did not seem to be winning the war there, <laughs> as mm. far as I can tell. I think you have to get the roots or something. It's, it's kind of a pain. But yeah, I'm seeing it all over my neighborhood all of a sudden. Mm, garlic mustard. Yeah, and it's uh, scientifically called Alaria petiolata. Alaria meaning uh, uh, allium-like garlic mm -hmm. and onions being alliums and chives and whatnot. And it is a biennial herbaceous flowering plant. Uh, herbaceous meaning no woody stems above the ground and biennial meaning it lives for two years. Mm. Not the same as biannual. <laughs> which is a little hard for me to keep straight personally, but yeah, apparently the first year it just grows in a little rosette of green leaves, which um, smells like garlic when you, well, any, any part of the plant actually smells like garlic when you crush it. And uh, it has cyanide in it, but somehow this is released when it's chopped up, I'm told. Uh, I might check with a qualified herb person who <laughs> knows a lot about that before I, because I don't know, is, is there a way you got to chop it? I feel like that might be an important question. But yeah, it's native to Europe, West and Central Asia, Northwest Africa, Morocco, Iberia, the British Isles, and parts of China. So, um... Uh, it's in the Brassicaceae family with cabbages and whatnot. A lot of edible plants in that one. Um, so, yeah, it flowers on its second year and also grows considerably taller on these tall stalks. Uh, it grows by hedges, which means one of its English nicknames is uh, Jack by the Hedge and huh. also uh, Poor Man's Garlic. Uh -huh. And, or poor man's mustard, I forget. Anyway, uh, it has a whitish taproot, which smells like radish. Mm -hmm. So that's a little odd. Decide, garlic, radish, what are you doing here? Um, so yeah, it has the two different forms and it has stalked triangular heart-shaped coarsely toothed, uh, or leaves with coarsely toothed margins. So I'm gonna have to look more closely at the next next time I'm out walking there, and it has a a fruit which is a four-sided capsule called a silique, 
which has like two rows of rows of seeds in it uh, per pod, and it can release one one plant can uh, release hundreds of seeds. So the, there's a reason what's the parable of the mustard seed in the Bible. Mm -hmm, all right. Yeah, yeah. So the spreading gospel is like a mustard seed. You know, you just tell, you just you know, put one seed and hundreds plant from that, supposedly. Which yeah, I don't know. Christianity is very successful. I guess that worked sometimes. <laughs> so definitely, the reason they were Jesus was using that um, the the mustard as a as a metaphor is because it's really good at reproducing, as uh, witness the South Bath Nature Center. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So, yeah, it was brought over by European immigrants to North America for culinary and medicinal purposes. And uh, unfortunately, it's toxic or unpalatable to most native herbivores and uh, a lot of butterflies, Lepidoptera. And uh, reduces diversity by dominating the understory mm -hmm. of uh, woods and forests. So it's not beneficial. Yep, you don't want that. You know. Yep. I, I, I will pull it up. As I'm walking along on a trail, if I see it, I'll, I will pull it up and just leave it on the trail. But yeah, uh, yeah okay. Well, thanks. So it is, awesome. it is edible, but use lots of caution. So yeah, it's theoretically edible. I'm, so. I, I'm afeard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks, Rebecca. Okay. All right. So now on to ecological news, and we got a, a bunch of stories to get through today. Our first one is kind of fun. Uh, one of the criticisms of wind power by uh, pro-nuclear people, actually, is that it's completely unpredictable, that, that it's, you know, you don't know how much power you're going to get, uh, and, as opposed to your nuke plants, which just put out 100% all the time. Uh, a story in Renew Economy uh, back on April 14th, title, Very Predictable. <laughs> uh, Study shows global wind energy production is stable. Yeah. And uh, it was talking about a study done by a company called Eoltech, E-O-L-T-E-H-T-E-C-H. And it turns out that they looked at 15 years of data from 300 geographical areas. And globally, wind power production only fluctuates by about 3%. Uh, now, as you drill down, as you get into smaller and smaller areas, uh, that 3% increases so like in Europe the over the same period it was seven percent and if you look at any particular wind farm in that you know globally out of those 300 ge geographical areas it can vary by as much as 25 percent but it's very true it's been you know now it's been proven with actual wind turbines that the wind's always blowing somewhere and taken as a whole globally the amount of wind power is very predictable and very steady so there's that good news. Uh, now, uh, on to our next story. And this one was uh, one of the speakers in that press conference referenced this. This is, this is good news. Uh, April 10th, EPA website, uh, final rule to strengthen standards for synthetic organic chemical plants and polymers and resin plants. Uh, they set new limits for the chemicals ethylene oxide and chloroprene and they set them uh, for ethylene oxide they set it all the way down to one part per million uh, in other words five pounds per year per factory uh, and a, a very important change in the rule is they got rid of the exception for startup shutdown and accidents or malfunctions as they're called because it used to be that while the plant was starting up or while it was shutting down they could put as much as they wanted in until they really got going, and then they had to uh, come into limits. So now the EPA is saying, no, no, you got to follow these limits from the beginning. And uh, they also, this rule also changed the total number of hazardous air pollutants uh, from 50 parts per million uh, down to 20 parts per million. And uh, it's forcing companies to flare the uh, flammable toxic gases and so that 20 parts per million has to be after flaring which is you know it's a big improvement it's much better uh, and so they should be given some credit for that now this is opposed as opposed to uh, they also EPA's enforcement is also up in uh, 2023 they did 199 criminal criminal investigations that's up 70 percent from 2022 
and they uh, also followed 1,789 civil cases against uh, corporations that were putting pollution in the air. So this is good. The EPA is finally doing its job again. But uh, we also have to look at these increases in terms of where they started from, which was uh, zero. <laughs> because during the uh, pandemic, when before COVID was declared over as an emergency, uh, President Trump had suspended all environmental regulations during COVID, saying it's an emergency, so we've got to allow companies to put as much pollution in there as they want. So uh, once President Biden lifted the COVID emergency, then the EPA had, had to start enforcing regulations again. So uh, we do need to give some credit where credit is due. Of course, ideally, there would be zero. Ideally, all these processes would be completely self-enclosed so that we're not putting any kind of pollution in the air so that we don't have the cancer alley where that uh, that woman, uh, Celine from uh, Louisiana, who spoke at the press conference, uh, would have to talk about any of her family or friends getting cancer. But So that's that should be the eventual goal, but at least we've taken a step towards it. All right, it was almost exactly a year ago that Germany closed its last three nuclear power plants. Yay! Yay. Still happy about that one. So uh, Clean Energy Wire went and took a look at the long-term effects of, what, of that, and they published, uh, on April 11th, they published Ger Germany's nuclear exit one year after. And uh, they went through all the effects, and basically all the pro-nuclear trolls have flooded the internet saying this has been an absolute disaster for Germany, uh, that their carbon went through the roof, that they now their electrical grid is all unstable. And uh, it turns out absolutely none of that is true. Uh, what this study showed is, first of all, there's been no supply challenges, you know, the no shortages, no brownouts, no blackouts. And Germany still has the most stable electrical grid in Europe, even though they no longer have nukes attached to their grid. Coal use did not skyrocket. In fact, over the last year, coal dropped to by 10%, and its coal use has dropped to its lowest point in 60 years. So uh, no dukes also means no coal. And the prices have dropped. Uh, back when they shut their plants, prices in Europe were at 53 euros per megawatt hour. Or no, the, excuse me, they were at 72 euros per megawatt hour, and they've dropped down to 53. So electricity is abundant and it's cheaper. And the, the reason is that renewables are up. And has, as has been proven many times, the, the less you rely on nuclear, the quicker you transition over to true renewables like wind and solar. And uh, so what happened when they shut the three plants down at once, uh, the year before, those three plants provided 30 terawatt hours of power to Germany, and uh, renewables provided 237 terawatt hours of power. And so in the following year with no nukes, the renewables had bumped up to 270 terawatt hours of power. So, so in other words, they shut down the nukes and they made up for it with renewables, particularly rooftop solar. The, the growth in rooftop solar in Germany just about equaled the loss of nuclear power. So uh, again, and again, and again, and again, we discover that rooftop solar can replace nukes, can get us to you know, almost all the way to, to zero carbon. Uh, National Re Renewable Energy Labs has calculated that in Ohio, just rooftop solar could provide 40% of all our electrical needs. So, uh, and it would be doing that too if we didn't have rules like uh, in Bowling Green where the municipal utility has essentially penalized people who try to put solar on the roof uh, because it's just cheaper and better. Uh, another story, and this one we get a little closer to home, M Live talking about Michigan back on April 8th. It turns out Beaver Island, Michigan has been declared the only international dark sky sanctuary in the state of Michigan. And Beaver Island, uh, specifically the State Wildlife Research Area, 
on the southern end of the island is now considered a dark sky sanctuary. And that basically just means that's where you can go to be sure to see the Milky Way, as long as it's, you know, not a full moon. And I, you know, I often urge people to get out and see the Milky Way. And, and when you see a full, beautiful sky with the Milky Way stretching across it, it is an echo of how you felt when you saw the, the full eclipse. You do get that, that wonderful awe, you know, that feeling of awe as you look up into a, uh, a night sky with tons with a uh, for those of you who have never been to the mountain west there's a lot more sky up there than what one realizes in ohio yeah <laughs> yeah so uh let's see in ohio we have one uh it's called a dark sky park and that is the john glenn astronomy park in hocking hills mm -hmm. and then in fact uh, in around the country we have 87 dark sky parks but we only have 10 dark sky sanctuaries where you're pretty much guaranteed if it's a clear night and there's no moon, you will see the Milky Way. And uh, Beaver Island now becomes the 11th dark sky sanctuary in the U.S. and the 20th dark sky sanctuary globally. So congratulations to Beaver Island. And it's a wonderful place to visit. You have to take the ferry there and they have this little, just a few little shops and restaurants right next to the ferry dock. And then the rest of the island, there's a few houses, there's some houses there, but the rest, much of the island is just uh, wild. It's a nice, it's a beautiful place to visit. Okay, on to our next story from The Guardian. And uh, the title is, EVs are booming, but electric bikes are really cutting emissions. And it turns out that uh, electric vehicles, electric cars, in 2022 displaced uh, 1.5 million barrels of oil every day globally, which uh, the global Globally, we use about 83.3 million barrels a day. So we cut, we, we would be using, you know, 85 million a day if we didn't have any EVs on the road. Uh, now the growth in oil use has uh, declined. In 2023, we grew by 2.3 million barrels per day, which is horrible. But in 2024, that growth is predicted to reduce by to only 1.3 million barrels a day more. So by the end of 2024, we'll be using 84.6 million barrels a day. But it would be much worse if we didn't have EVs on the road. And two thirds of that uh, 1.5 million, in other words, 1 million barrels per day, that was reduced by the use of electric bikes and electric scooters. So these little electric scooters you see uh, zipping around on, you know, all over Toledo, and now they have got it going in Bowling Green too. Uh, those are creating most of the actual reduction. And it makes sense cool. because, you know, moving a little scooter around takes a whole lot less energy than, than driving a whole big uh, van, like my Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid van, which I love. Uh, of course, it's not always practical to use a scooter, like to get up here and like give Rebecca a ride to the studio every Sunday morning on one of those little Velo scooters would be... You'd have to leave real early. Yeah, I'd have to leave early. It'd be a little problematic, both you of us. You need some bugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, worldwide, globally, these are catching on, especially in China. In fact, uh, China had 95% of the e-bikes and moped, electric mopeds and uh, right now there's 300 million of these they're called micro transports worldwide versus only 26 million full-fledged electric cars so uh, it's cheaper to use these little scooter thingies uh, it's been estimated that if you have a 12 mile commute every day five days a week uh, you're only going to spend 40 dollars a year on your transportation energy as opposed to uh, car where you might or right now you're spending 40 to 50 dollars per fill up so uh, so it's it's good it's part of the transition and we're making it so but of course there are those who are trying to stop and slow this transition uh, chief amongst them in ohio were the architects of ohio's hb6 and we have history lovers we have yet another it's never going to end rebecca i, I decided I this know. story will just never finish probably not yeah. um hb6 news this past week uh unfortunate news 
uh, Sam Randazzo, the former head of the Public Utilities Commission, uh, has is dead. He apparently committed suicide. And, Whoa, I didn't even hear about that, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. And he follows, of course, last year, uh, Neil Clark, who's also indicted in the whole HB6 con uh, nuclear power bribery scandal. He also committed suicide. So that's not the same guy who told us all he'd be back, right? <laughs> No. Different uh, guy, okay. I, well, Just checking, because that one ain't in to be back. <laughs> no, no, he's not coming <laughs> back. Yeah. Really not, no. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, this terrible tragedy. These guys are, are pushing this horrible energy policy, and they're literally paying the ultimate price uh, for trying to force the wrong energy policy on us. And it's, you know, it's a, it's terrible. It's horrible. But the industry does not care about you. But that's the that's the bottom line is that they're learning that they're, you know, the nuclear industry is willing to use them. And as soon as they're no longer useful, the nuclear industry will abandon them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, <laughs> so um, some more news along with this scandal is that uh, Lieutenant Governor John Husted uh, got a million dollars in secret donations from First Energy as part of the run-up to HB6. Uh, that's our story for the Energy News Network, April 4th or April 10th. Uh, it's also reported by the Ohio Capital Journal. Uh, this was he, this was money he received for his 2017 primary bid from some uh, dark money group called Freedom Frontier. And DeWine, our governor, also got a million dollars from this 501c4. So, so the scandal has finally touched DeWine. So we're there. All right, folks, that's it for this show. I had one more piece of good news, but I guess this will have to save that for, for next week. The song just, just uh, said done. Yeah, I'm hearing the music, <laughs> so we got to go. Done. Thanks so much for listening. This bye is bye. Joe DeMar. And Rebecca Wood. And we are signing off. No more three-headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun.